हेलो एवरीवन सलाम नमस्ते आदाब एंड वेलकम टू टूडेज इवेंट माइनॉरिटी राइट्स अंडर इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन वी हैव टू स्टीम स्पीकर्स प्रोफेसर फैजान मुस्तफा वाइस चांसलर ऑफ ला यूनिवर्सिटी हैदराबाद and joining him is honorable justice akbar ahmed ansari hopefully he has not joined yet but hopefully he will be joining uh, so to do a formal introduction or opening remarks i have been invited founder of hindus for human rights a very famous activist group in united states uh, raju rajgopal to have few minutes okay thank you raju yes uh, thanks 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 everyone uh, i'm raju rajagopal uh, co-founder of hindus for human rights and we are an advocacy organization that speaks for human rights and religious freedom of all communities in india and in north america uh, before i have the pleasure of uh, again introducing our distinguished speakers today on the topic of minority rights as envisioned in the indian constitution uh, I want to take this opportunity if I may to say a few words as a prelude and as an Indian American nearly 150 years before the Indian constitution was born America's founding fathers were greatly concerned about the need to protect minority rights and they were very fearful of the potential for a tyranny of the majority president thomas jefferson reiterated this concept of democracy in 1801 in his first inaugural address the essence of democracy is majority rule the making of binding decisions by a vote of more than one half of all persons who participate in an election however constitutional democracy in our time requires majority rule with minority rights he went down to say bear in mind this sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail that will to be rightful must be reasonable that the minority possess their equal rights which equal law must protect and to violate that would be oppression john patrick in his understanding democracy further elaborated in every genuine democracy today majority rule is both endorsed and limited by the supreme law of the constitution which protects the rights of individuals tyranny by minority over the majority is barred but so is tyranny of the majority against minorities sadly what we are witnessing in india today in my humble view is the realization of the worst fears of america's founding fathers but there is one important difference we are simultaneously witnessing a tyranny of the majority if you see india's elections as leading to a legitimate majority rule and a tyranny of the minority where a much smaller minority of hindutva politicians or using that majority rule to turn india into a repressive majoritarian state this is no accident we should have seen it coming for two important reasons one the constant propaganda that minority rights were somehow special privileges afforded only to the minorities that are not available to the majority community unfortunately even some of the rhetoric of minority religious leaders sometimes have tended to reinforce that faulty view second complete lack of school and college education on our constitution unlike in the united states other than niceties about dr ambedkar and our founding fathers without ever teaching the substance of the fundamental rights enumerated in the constitution this also in many ways explains the split personality of many hindu americans who are enjoying the protection of minority rights under the indian constitution under the us constitution and yet feel no contradiction in the denial of the same to india's minorities and i i hope that our distinguished guest today will be able to touch upon these points as well as whatever they have in mind already uh, to tell us about the indian constitution so it's now privilege to introduce our first speaker professor faisal mustafa uh, is an academic and legal scholar and the vice chancellor of nalsar university of law hyderabad he also sits on the board of directors of technology incubator the t hub he graduated from amu like many of you i think in this panel in history and law and also his doctorate in copyright law and a diploma 
on international and comparative human religious rights law. It's my privilege, Professor Mustafa, to introduce you to this uh, group of activists, uh, both from India and the United States. Welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening. If uh, there are viewers from uh, India, I'm uh, really grateful to Razi Bhai for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you about uh, minority rights. And I must uh, thank uh, the introducer who was able to uh, set the agenda for the conversation we are going to have. Uh, I'm a little sorry that I'm not in the best of the mental frame uh, in terms of uh, speaking as uh, my mother is sick and she's in the hospital, but uh, by God's grace, uh, she is recovering. So uh, first of all, I think uh, we are talking at a time when uh, uh, minority rights uh, are subject of uh, some ridicule. Uh, minorities are uh, not considered to be the uh, equal uh, partners in the governance of the country, the number of uh, Muslim MPs and uh, MLAs uh, are all at all time low of some 303 MPs of Lok Sabha of the ruling party, not a single one is a Muslim. But as a student of constitutional law, I don't want to really go too much into the uh, politics against the minority rights and would like to confine myself to the constitutional scheme on minority rights. Because a few days back, uh, we read in newspaper that there is a 114 page Hindu Raj constitution which has been prepared. I very much wish that the constitution of the Hindu Raj is made public and a meaningful objective uh, debate takes place uh, on that uh, uh, draft constitution. Similarly, today uh, there was some article uh, where we had some former judge also as one of the authors saying Ram Rajya is the part of the basic structure of the constitution. So uh, my position is that uh, first of all, we need to answer certain questions. One, who is a minority? Because many people, including uh, some uh, great right-wing activists have been going to the Supreme Court uh, seeking a declaration of Hindus as a minority. So we must get the idea or the concept of the minority right. Uh, uh, internationally speaking, transgenders are minority, uh, gays and lesbians are minorities, uh, women are minorities, children are minorities, but Indian constitution talks of only two kinds of minorities. Minorities, whether based on religion or language. And therefore, what is the meaning of word minority is crucial for our uh, conversation because if Hindus are also a minority, what is the fuss about the minority rights? Why minority rights are to be said to be the uh, appeasement of the minorities? I recall that many, many years ago, there was a committee appointed by BJP <coughs> <coughs> under the chairmanship of their uh, vice president an ideologue, K.R. Malkani, which had suggested that we should delete Article 29 and 30 from the Constitution because they serve no purpose. Two, I believe the second question is, which is more important and to which uh, uh, Professor Raj Gopal Mekar had a reference in a very enlightened and brief and effective introduction. Why do you need minority rights? If you have right to equality and right to religion available to all citizens, and if there is a non-discrimination clause in the constitution in article 15, why special rights or special protection is required for the minorities? 
This is the second question which I would like to answer this evening. And the third one, how these uh, provisions in the constitution have been interpreted by our judiciary. So what is the uh, real import of uh, these laudable provisions in the constitution? How they have worked on ground? That is the third question which I would like to respond to and what are the challenges in the implementation? And I believe that uh, if in a forum like this and in a uh, event like this, I do not talk about the minority character of my alma mater, Aligarh Muslim University, and the three decisions which have been given by the Supreme Court in 1968 and two decisions by the Allahabad High Court in 2005, I won't be able uh, to do justice with this topic and justice with the uh, viewers of uh, this event. So this is my agenda this evening or this morning for you. Let me first of all uh, start with what Gandhiji himself said. Of course, uh, we don't anymore believe in his ideology in the true sense of the term. Rather, at times we celebrate the uh, people who were responsible for his assassination. Nevertheless, he continues to be the father of nation and therefore uh, uh, deserves to be uh, recalled and paid our respect. A few days back, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, his uh, Shaheed Divas on 30th of January. So Gandhiji says that the claim of a country to civilization depends on the treatment it extends to minority. If you want to be called as a civilization, then the test is and the yardstick is that we must see what kind of protection you have given to the minorities. Lord Acton added another dimension when he said, the most certain test by which we judge whether a country is really free is the amount of security enjoyed by minorities. We just heard uh, uh, that the majority in democracy will rule and the minority will have rights. Our current vice president uh, repeats it in the house that uh, the opposition will uh, have a debate and the government uh, will have the decisions of the house, which is true. But then uh, having a democracy does not mean majoritarianism. Because if that had been the case, the power of the judicial review would not have been given to the judiciary. Judicial review looks absolutely anti-democratic. Both the houses of the parliament unanimously pass a law which was the case recently in the National Judicial Appointment Commission, which was the first constitutional amendment, which was passed by the Modi government in 2014, passed unanimously in Lok Sabha. And in Rajya Sabha, it was passed with near unanimity in the sense that the whole house agreed with it, except legendary Ram Jait Malani. When it went to the Supreme Court, the four judges of the Supreme Court threw it in a dustbin as violative of basic structure of the Constitution. So if numbers really count, then of course, judiciary should not have the power to nullify the decisions made by the Congress in US, or British Parliament in England, or Sansad in India. But the power of the judicial review is to ensure that the majority will not behave in a majoritarian way. They have to go strictly by the constitution and they cannot violate the rights of the minorities. And it is in this context that I believe that the debate on the status of minorities and on minority rights should be lifted from the communalism versus secularism. 
and the nationalism versus sectarianism debate. And it must be placed in the theoretical field of democracy, equality, and rights. So I'm not particularly keen whether you are a secular state or you are not a secular state. In fact, in an article which received a lot of uh, uh, attention, I had said that the way and the stage at which we have reached Probably it is not a bad idea to debate what kind of Hindu Rasht we want. And that is why what I am saying about the 114 page constitution to which I have no access. I had said it in March 2020 in an Indian Express article that let us discuss what kind of Hindu Rasht we want. Would it be like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, or it is going to be like England or Greece, or it is going to be like uh, uh, Sri Lanka? The Sri Lankan constitution declares Buddhism to be the dominant cultural heritage. That's it. And I have said that once we get into a Hindu Rasht, the Hindu fanatics would be most disappointed and frustrated because even in the Hindu Rasht, you will have right to vote for minorities. You will have right to equality. You will have right to lie. You will have freedom of religion. It is impossible today for any democratic country and more so for a multi-religious country like India that we deny rights, equal rights to the citizens. And that's why my case of minority rights has nothing to do with secularism. It has nothing to do with religious freedom. My case for minority rights is all about democracy, equality, and rights. The case for minority rights in my opinion, should drive from and be legitimized by our understanding of democracy. These guarantees, in my opinion, are essential in a democratic and pluralistic polity because as American President Roosevelt rightly reminded us, no democracy can long survive, which does not accept as fundamental to its very existence, the recognition of the rights of the minorities. And it is in this background that Articles 25 to 30 of Indian Constitution were enacted in our Constitution. And allow me to quote the memorable words of Justice H.R. Khanna, who is too tall in the ADM Jabalpur case, what is said to be the habeas corpus case, when our Supreme Court had its darkest hour, I mean, the four judges of the Supreme Court said that the writ of habeas corpus does not lie during emergency. And Justice H.R. Khanna uh, was the sole dissenter, and he sacrificed his chief justice ship for this. This is what he said in the nine judge bench judgment of St. Xavier's College uh, in Gujarat. These provisions, means Articles 25 to 30, enshrined are a befitting pledge to the minorities in the Constitution of a country whose greatest son has laid down his life for the protection of the minorities. As long as the Constitution of the, as long as the Constitution stands, as it is today, no tempering with these rights can be countenanced. Any attempt to do so would not only be an act of breach of faith, it would be constitutionally impermissible. So that is the context. That is the object. If we want to be a democracy, if we want to have equality, we have to have these rights. Now my first question, and which is very important question, who is a minority? 
word minority occurs in Indian constitution at four places, but no definition is given. Supreme Court has defined it. And Supreme Court has picked up what is globally called the numerical inferiority test. So if you are less than 50%, you are to be treated as a minority. This test may not be sufficient because at times you may have numbers. In terms of numbers, you may be in majority. But in the power structure of the state, you may be powerless. And therefore, this number game, the preponderance or lack of numbers alone is not a guide for an authoritative definition. And therefore, we need to look at the second element. And the second element is the powerlessness lacking domination. One may have the numerical strength. One may be in the majority, yet one may be powerless. I recall apartheid in South Africa. Blacks were indeed in huge numbers, but they were powerless. I had written a very interesting article for the Outlook magazine. And the article went like this. Oh, forget about the minority character of Aligarh Muslim University. Even Banaras Hindu University was a minority university. This was my case. Because during the British time, just like in South Africa, where whites were less, they were a numerical minority, but they dominated the power structure of the state. Similarly, in India, British were miserable minority. In 1947, you had only about one lakh British in India. And we were 34 lakh crores. They dominated us. So when Banaras Hindu University was established in 1915, Hindus were also a minority. Minority because they were powerless. Power was with the British, with the whites. And therefore, they made, therefore, they made an effort to establish an educational institution of their choice, where Hindu culture and Hindu religion can be cherished and can be celebrated. Because in a modern state, a state or public square cannot be used to promote any religion. If you need to create that space, you need to allow the religious minorities to have educational institutions of their choice, where their culture, their language, their religion can flourish. That is the space, that is the logic of the minority rights. And therefore, if you look at the Banaras Hindu University Act of 1915, it very clearly says that in the university court, only a Hindu can be a member. It very clearly talks of promoting Hindu religion, Hindu culture, Vedic sciences, etc. After independence, had Banaras been in Kashmir or in Nagaland and Hindus being in minority, BHU would have continued as a minority institution. Why? Because minorities are not defined nationally. Constitutionally speaking, if you go by the Supreme Court's judgment, Minorities are to be defined at the level of a state. And why? Because Supreme Court have said, has said that Article 30 is talking of minorities, whether based on religion 
or language both the expressions are coming together and supreme court said in a catena of cases that since states were carved out on the linguistic basis minorities are to be defined at the level of a state if minorities are to be defined at the level of a state then definitely had banaras been in nagaland or in kashmir it would have been a minority hindu minority institution and believe me and take it from me in the dav college jalandhar when punjab government tried to impose punjabi as a medium of instruction it was challenged and it was said that they cannot impose punjabi medium of instruction because these are a minority institution and that is why i am saying if minorities are defined at the state level there are 7 to 8 states in india where hindus are religious minority kashmir may have become a union territory but article 30 protection would be there and hindus as a minority are entitled to all the rights of the minorities so in some states hindus are a religious minority and in all other states they are a linguistic minority if i am a tamil brahmin and i have settled in azamgarh i want to set up a tamil medium school it would be a minority institution with all the rights available just like christians and muslims to the tamil brahmin and i see it with full sense of responsibility that hundreds of hindu minority institutions are there in the country hundreds you have about 100 institutions of even sindhi language sindhi minority of kannad language of tamil because media is in our hand we have perfected the art of fake news therefore we have convinced this nation that minority rights mean some very special right of christians and muslims and therefore article 30 is appeasement and therefore article 30 must be deleted so the first test in defining minority is the numerical inferiority test anyone who is less than 50% is a minority the second test is the powerlessness test muslims meet both the tests yet you have a judgment from allahabad high court saying muslims are not a minority in india and you have a judgment from the supreme court in the bal patil case where they have refused to recognize jains as a minority and they have said that they will not permit any other religious minority to be added to the list of the minority i have critiqued this judgment by saying what absurd proposition it is article 25 does not say that no new religion will be born in any case jainism is an old religion it was founded you know in 600 bc but article 25 envisages any one of the audience may say that i am a prophet or i am a god and if there are people who consider him or her as a god or as a prophet and he says i am now starting a new religion that religion would be entitled to constitutional protection how can you say that no new religion will come in the world anymore then there may be a situation where somebody may be powerless or somebody may be 
numerically inferior and its word view and its values are either not reflected at all or insufficiently reflected both in the public sphere and in the constitution of societal norms. Yet that group may not want a minority status. And therefore it is necessary that not only somebody is numerically inferior or powerless, but they want recognition, independent recognition of a group as a separate group. And if they want that, and they want to preserve their distinctive identity, and that identity may not conform to the norms and the values of the majority, then they are a minority. Nobody can deny them that status. And that's why I believe minority recognition or minority status is a question of fact. It does not require any judicial acknowledgement. It does not require any judicial pronouncement. That brings me to the second question. Why these rights? Why Article 14, which guarantees equality, is not enough for the minorities? Why Article 21, which gives right to life and personal liberty, is not enough? Why you need special rights? And to understand this, as I said, for me, secularism and freedom of religion are not reasons of the minority rights. I place it in the theoretical field of democracy, equality, and rights. And therefore, we must understand this whole idea of special rights in addition to universal rights. Now, this is not something very new. What I'm asking, has been there, for instance, in Article 19 of the Austrian Constitutional Law of 1867, which acknowledged that ethnic minorities have an absolute right to maintain and develop their nationality and their languages. 1867, similar provisions were there in the Hungary's Act of 1868. And in the Constitution of Swiss Confederation of 1874, which guaranteed the three languages of the country equal rights in civil services, legislation, and the courts. But this whole idea of having separate rights developed after the First World War. The provisions of peace treaties after the First World War focus particularly on the status of minorities. Minority protections were codified in five treaties that were negotiated between the Allies and associated powers on the one hand, and Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Greece, and Yugoslavia on the other. Special provisions for minorities were incorporated in the peace treaties with Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Turkey while Albania, Finland, and Iraq declared that they would protect their minorities. And there was more. The entry of East European countries into the League of Nations was made conditional on the grant of minority rights. And the League was entrusted with the responsibility to see that these commitments were observed. So these post-World War I treaties they provided a model for minority rights. As the states assured equality of treatment to all inhabitants without distinction of birth, nationality, language, race, or religions. Minority groups were given the right to establish, manage, and control at their own expense charitable, religious, educational, and social institutions 
and the right to use their own language and religion freely. These are the things which are there in Article 25 to Article 30. Complaints against transgression of the provisions of the treaty could be brought to International Court of Justice and the League of Nations could initiate actions against offenders in certain specified cases. Thus, the International Court of Justice was to play an important role in securing minority rights. And there are two notable judgments which I want this August audience to know. One is the 1930 Permanent Court of International Justice Advisory Opinion in Greco-Bulgarian community case where the question was, what is the definition of minority? And the Permanent Court of International Justice defined community not in terms of numbers, but in terms of shared religious, racial, and linguistic traditions. Traditions that the group wished to preserve and perpetuate through rituals, education, and socialization of the young. The existence of community ruled the court further is not dependent upon recognition by law. Same thing which I told you a few minutes back. If a community exists in the shape of a group of members united by a host of cultural factors that are distinctive to them, and if this community is intent on maintaining these cultural markers, this is more than enough reason to regard that group as a community. Are we a community? If we have shared religious, racial, linguistic traditions, if we want to preserve those traditions, those rituals, we are a community and we have a right to community. That is the justification of minority rights. Secondly, the essential principles for the minority protection were laid down by the Permanent Court of International Justice in 1935 in the case of minority schools in Albania. The objective of minority rights, the court said, is to secure for minority groups the possibility of living peaceably alongside with the rest of population and cooperating amicably with them while at the same time preserving the characteristics that distinguish them from the majority and satisfying the ensuing social needs. States were entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring complete equality and with in instituting suitable means for the preservation of traditions of the minority groups. Equality in law, court said, precludes discrimination of any kind, whereas equality in fact may involve the necessity of different treatment in order to attain a result which establishes an equilibrium between different situations. It is easy to imagine cases in which equality of treatment of majority and minority whose situations and requirements are different would result in inequality. This is the logic. If you have an unfair race, someone has gone to the public school and someone has studied in a vernacular medium and you say, okay, both of you write the exam of civil services. It's an equal race. No, it is not an equal race. There is a difference between a formal equality and substantive equality. Substant substantive equality demands classification. It demands giving preferences. It demands affirmative action, reservation. Therefore, if you say all institutions are the same, majority, minority, everybody is same, equality, it is only formal equality. If you want substantive equality for me, then give me an institution where my culture will flourish. 
where my language will flourish, where my religion will flourish, where I will have a community which will have similar tastes. Unko bhi halim khana aata ho. Nahari paaye hamare saath baiht ke I need that community and that ambience because I am a community, because I am a distinctive community and I have right to preserve my distinctiveness. That distinctiveness can be preserved when you give me a group which is similar to me. But this is nobody's claim that a minority institution will admit only the minority institutions. Look at the minority institutions. They have 50% reservation for non-minorities. Minorities are investing their money, their resources, setting up institutions to educate non-minorities and yet we are criticized. The responsibility of my education is absolutely on the government because I am the citizen. Since government is not establishing adequate number of institutions, minorities come forward, they invest their money, they raise donations for a legal Muslim university. They ask to raise 30 lakhs. When I was the registrar of a legal Muslim university in 2005, I got, got it calculated what is the current value. It was 268 crores in 2005. It was not a small effort. I have myself seen thousands of receipts of one pesa. There was one magistrate, Jafar Hussain, who started a campaign of collection of one rupee from each family. So many waqf properties were given to illegal. So minorities, to preserve their culture, they invest money. Nevertheless, all these treaties of post First World War, they did not yield the result and you got a Second World War. Second World War started on the question of minority rights only. Germany adopted an active role in the league. The Nazis encouraged German minorities in Czechoslovakia and Poland to escalate their demands on the local regimes and use this as a pretext to invade these countries. The consolidation of anti-Semitism in Germany and the repression that was launched on the Jewish population there hammered a further nail in the coffin of minority rights. In the end, what happened? Totalitarian and dictator states like Germany, Hungary, and Italy persecuted the minorities in their own territories. At the same time, they posed as the protectors of minorities in states that were really democratic. And therefore, post Second World War, you had to come up with Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights very clearly in paragraph one of article two, very clearly says, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth and other status. And then in 1966, you got two covenants, the 27th clause of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights very clearly provided for the minority rights. When we come to Indian Constituent Assembly and we debated the whole question of the minority rights, there was a suggestion by Mahavir Tyagi that let us see what Pakistan is giving to its minority we would give similar rights to our minorities in India. 
the senior elements in the constituent assembly said india has nothing to do with pakistan it is their problem we are a different country minority rights has been on our agenda from day one and therefore in the indian constituent assembly debates you had an excellent discussion on the whole logic of minority rights i am just reading out to you from the supreme court judgment in the kerala education bill 1957 this is a opinion of justice venkat rama iyer it is well known that during middle ages the accepted notion was that sovereigns were entitled to impose their own religion on their subjects and those who did not conform to it could be dealt with as traitors it was this notion that was responsible during the 16th and 17th centuries for numerous wars between nations and the civil wars in the continent of europe and it was only laterly that it came to be recognized that freedom of religion is not compatible incompatible freedom of religion is not incompatible with good citizenship and the loyalty to the state and that all progressive societies should respect the religious beliefs of their minorities it is this concept that is embodied in articles 25 26 29 and 30 of our constitution every constitution basically is a sacred pact constitution is a compact it is an agreement it is a pledge this is the pledge which founders of our country have given to us that if you don't go to pakistan and you stay here these are your rights for a country which was divided in the name of religion i think the far sightedness of the founders of indian constitution is to be appreciated because they are trying to preserve pluralism they are trying to preserve the distinctive cultural identities and that i think is valuable and that i think makes indian constitution unique and why we need minority rights we need minority rights because individual rights may not be sufficient i as an individual have never faced any discrimination government of india has been very kind kind to me i have been nominated to so many committees but slighting my culture holding it up for ridicule denying its value and so on hurts me and offends my dignity it is particularly offensive if the slight bears the imprimatur of my state or of the majority or official culture of my country you need collective rights because individual rights are not sufficient as an individual i cannot preserve my culture to preserve my culture i need razi bhai and faisal sa unless these two are there ghalib ki shahri pe kaise baatein karu unless these two are there biryani ke different types pe kaise baatein so for my food taste for my literary taste for my cultural autonomy i need a group and therefore right to equality your right to life or right to religion which are individual rights are not sufficient to preserve a community to conserve a community k r malkani had said that article 29 is to be repealed is to be removed from the constitution i am shocked article 29 says any section of indian citizens having a distinct language a script or culture of its own shall have the right to conserve the same 
it does not use word minority this is the right of every citizen if you have distinctive culture you have distinctive language you have distinctive script you have a right to conserve the same article 30 what great right it gives right to establish and administer educational institution minorities do not have a right to mal administer it is unfortunate that many institutions run by muslim minority are in bad shape and almost all institutions which are run by the christian minority are great institutions and there are many institutions minority institutions which are run by hindus as linguistic minorities and they are in great shape article 30 is not the right of the management it is the right of the community and therefore it is important that we understand that the collective rights are needed to establish the preconditions of not only individual right to culture but individual right to live with dignity and respect in the way the concept of recognition defines respect i believe that this is the theoretical background which makes it absolutely clear that we must preserve cultures each culture is important let us not ridicule any culture each cultural response enriches our understanding as a nation we need all the perspectives on the plate that's why indians don't believe in the melting pot they believe in the salad bowl where distinctive identities of all the groups will be preserved together in one plate that is what the unity within diversity is all about so community rights cannot be a substitute for individual rights we need individual rights as well as community rights now when you come to the judicial interpretation of these rights indian supreme court has been really very very supportive of the minority rights why because as pandit nehru himself said that this constitution is a design for future many of our discussions here are inevitably derived from the past we cannot get rid of them none of us can because we are part of the past but we ought to try to get ourselves disconnected from the past if we are to mold the future gradually look at this we are framing a constitution in the wake of partition yet at that time we are guaranteeing rights to minorities k munshi said the most important task before the constituent assembly was to secure political consolidation of the nation its bases had been destroyed by the british by statutorily fragmenting political india into religious communities under the guise of protecting the minorities i believe the way framers of indian constitution worked on this constitution is remarkable and this has been the congress's position at least from 1930 pandit nehru while writing for young india on may 15 1930 had to say the history of india and of the many countries of europe has demonstrated that there can be no stable equilibrium in any country so long as an attempt is made to crush a minority 
और फोर्स इट टू कंफर्म टू द वेज ऑफ द मेजोरिटी देर इज नो श्योर मेथड ऑफ राउजिंग द रिजेंटमेंट ऑफ द माइनॉरिटी एंड कीपिंग इट अपार्ट फ्रॉम द रेस्ट ऑफ द नेशन देन टू मेक इट फील दैट इट हैज नॉट गॉट द फ्रीडम to stick to its own ways it matters little whether logic is on its side or whether its own brand of culture is worthwhile or not the mere fact of losing it makes it dear therefore we in india must make it clear to all that our policy is based on guaranteeing this freedom to the minorities that under no circumstance will any coercion or repression of them be tolerated we can also lay down as our deliberate policy that there shall be no unfair treatment of any minority indeed we should go further in state it will be the business of the state to give favor treatment to minority and backward communities the point i am trying to draw home this evening is very simple that from day one this was our understanding of minority rights our supreme court from day one has been saying minority institutions are for the minority there shall be only sprinkling of outsiders there you cannot have minority institutions as exclusive institution this is one brief one part of the deal that i need razi bhai and faisal bhai for my culture for my conversation to flourish but my culture should also reach those who are not members of my group that can happen only when in minority institution non minorities are admitted when they are there then they should see what is my culture what is my language what is my food taste what is my religion how do i celebrate my festivals and therefore in a minority institution you will have non minorities as well supreme court interpreted each word of article 13 in the widest possible terms i give you an example article 30 says minorities shall have right to establish educational institutions of their choice the question was what is the meaning of educational institution the effort was to say university is not an educational institution supreme court said what nonsense educational institution includes a university therefore a university can be a minority university the question was whether minority institutions will get the government aid article 30 clause 2 is explicit it says state in granting aid shall not discriminate against an educational institution just because it is a minority managed institution so i can be a 100% aided institution like aligarh or like jamia and i can also be a minority institution state aid in no way dilutes my minority character because supreme court is explicit in saying in sirdaj bhai's case and in tma pai 11 foundation case that state aid cannot come with such conditions which shall destroy the minority character of the institution if state imposes such conditions which will annihilate the minority character the condition is null and void supreme court has said that the state can regulate but in the name of regulation it cannot take over the administration it can regulate and then court said every regulation by the state must pass the dual test the dual test is 
that it should be a regulation. It cannot be takeover. To the regulation must make the minority institution, quoting Supreme Court's words, an effective vehicle of minority education. If government comes up with any, con any condition of regulation, the test is to see whether that regulation will make that educational institution a better institution of the minority education. And then the word in Article 30 was minorities shall have right to establish and administer educational institution of their choice. Supreme Court said of their choice means of their choice. It is within the power of the minority to expand their choice as much as they want. Therefore, if minorities want IIT, they can establish it. If they want aims, they can establish it. If they want to set up a national law university, they have a right to do it. Unfortunately, when Aligarh Muslim University's case went to the Supreme Court, it's a long, long, painful story. Can you believe the Aligarh's administration could not muster the courage to join the legal battle? In 1968, AMU's minority character was taken by the Supreme Court and the university was condemned unheard. You violated the basic principle of natural justice that no one shall be condemned unheard. AMU administration could not muster the courage to argue in the Supreme Court. Can you believe it? And the Supreme Court telling us without any evidence, without any arguments, without any document being produced. Oh, illegal people wanted recognition of their degrees. In section six of the AMU Act of 1920, it is written, that the degrees of illegal Muslim university shall be recognized at par with other universities. In recognition of degrees, to get the recognition of degrees, the founders have surrendered their fundamental right to the minority character. I say it without any fear of contradiction that this statement of Justice uh, Vanchu Chief Justice Wan Chu is absolutely speculative, factually wrong, historically wrong. There was no debate, no discussion in the negotiations between the government and the uh, 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 founders of a legal Muslim university on the issue of recognition of degrees. If I am setting up an educational institution, I will definitely want its degrees to be recognized. I can't be establishing an educational institution whose degrees are not recognized. Similarly, in the Aligarh Muslim University Act, just because it was a term of art, in the preamble it has come, whereas it is expedient to establish a Muslim university at Aligarh. They say it means parliament established it not the minority community. Razibai, just one minute, I'm closing. Parliament established it. Establishment means Supreme Court said coming into existence. There was no illegal Muslim university before 1920. And therefore, in 1920, a new institution was born. This argument, again, is factually, legally, historically wrong. Aligarh Muslim University even today does not have the right to change the name of buildings. Especially, Holger Nam nahi badal sakti university. 
लिटन लाइब्रेरी का नाम नहीं बदल सकती यूनिवर्सिटी बिकॉज एक्ट से यू डोंट है All the students of MAO college were admitted to Aligarh Muslim University. They became students of Aligarh Muslim University. All the rights, liabilities of MAO college were inherited by Aligarh Muslim University. Section five is absolutely clear. All the debts of MAO college became debts of Aligarh Muslim University. it was argued in allahabad oh mao college was dissolved professor mustafa you don't understand dissolution it is gone it has disappeared raj bahadur was arguing for old boys when the judge said it was dissolved he said yes my lord dissolved the way sugar is dissolved in the tea it remains there and legally speaking i tell you even today it is there you see there is one law which is called public law there is another law which is called private law public law can be changed private law cannot be changed if razi bhai's father or grandfather or great grandfather made a will giving some property to mao college that property can be used by aligarh muslim university only if aligarh muslim university is mao college nobody in any country in the world has the power to change the content of a will or content of a gift because it is part of private law even today if you want you can make a will in favor of mao college you can make a gift in favor of mao college and it will all go to aligarh muslim university i believe huge injustice has been done by giving extremely narrow construction to the words establish within few words in very very reverend mother provincial a six judge bench of the supreme court overruled this establishment meaning and it said establishment also means to found and an institution can be founded by one philanthropic individual i want to set up a university i am in 1920 the only thing i can do is to request the government to make a law if you make a law you say you established it that is like taking i take my pregnant wife to a hospital and the gynecologist said well after all it is my child i was the one who delivered it you were not even in the labor room that would be an absurd argument to say in the corporate law you have a principle of lifting the veil lift the veil pierce the veil and see who are the founders and look at the aligarh muslim university act itself it has an annexure in which names of 120 founders are given if aligarh muslim university is not a minority institution in my opinion no other institution in india will meet the test of a minority correct i'll stop him wow wonderful as expected faizan or professor faizan mustafa sahab wonderful so inspirational and so informative uh, just to conclude your uh, talk or the theme today now we are inviting honorable justice akbal ahmed ansari sahab former chief justice of patna high court and now presently uh, uh, president or uh, chairperson of punjab minorities commission uh, welcome justice akbal ahmed sir thank you 
<coughs> thank you there is some uh, communication gap in the sense that uh, i was aware of the subject which professor faizan mustafa will take up and what will be my role i had assumed and rightly so that i will be required to some of the discussion to yeah i mean we have a I, question and answer session afterwards for the audience so i think audience won't be able to i mean they will be just asking random question so you can sum up uh, professor fazal mustafa azar very briefly you see one thing which you must be aware in mind all of us that law is a subject which does is which never remains static it develops and develops without even change in the law when the society changes the concept of the society changes the outlook of the society the views of the society change the law is stand changed there need not necessarily be a formal amendment of the law i'll just give you one quick example the definition of rape in uk has been by and large unlawful sexual intercourse by a man with a woman without his without her will or against her consent i repeat unlawful sexual intercourse by a man without the consent of the woman or against her will the question arose if within this definition a husband will be liable for committing rape on his wife if he has sex forcibly with his wife the court decided that no by marriage the woman surrenders to the husband and therefore if the husband has sex with her even against her will or contrary to her consent or without her consent it will not amount to rape the definition remains substantially the same but the society changed and in the changed society when this question again came up the court said gone are those days when men and women were not equal partners today they are equal partners and therefore the law unlawful has to be read within the institution of marriage and if it is read within the institution of marriage there is no reason why the husband cannot be made liable for committing rape on his wife if he has sex with her without her consent or against her will so you can see the definition remains the same but the result has completely turned up upside down we have heard for zain mustafa on what a minority is what are the rights of the minority in general and what are the rights of the minorities in particular under the constitution of india and also the constitutional status as far as the minority is concerned of the aligarh muslim university very powerfully very lucidly very precise words and convincingly professor fazan mustafa in his usual style has spoken about this and uh, after his speech i don't think there is anything <laughs> required to be added whatever i will say will really be only adding repeating rather adding anything will not be possible i will only clarify one thing which i am sure he has already made it clear that there are two kinds of minorities one is numerical say for instance hindus are majority in india and muslims are numerically minority but as far as for example mustafa has tried to point out the number alone may not be possible to determine whether a person is or is not from a minority group say for instance during the time of apartheid in a white men were at the helm of affair in south in africa but the majority were black but the real power rested in the hands of the white so that is why it is not necessary that numerically you will have to be 
fewer than other to be a minority. Even if you are in larger in number, you can still be a minority if you don't have the strength to stand up. Now, nowadays, there is a lot of argument on the question as to what are the rights given because constitution speaks of the protection of the minorities and not of their rights. And there is no obligation on the part of the government to give any kind of right or any kind of facility to the government. Whereas Prasad Mustafa has very clearly pointed out that in the establishment of uh, minority institutions, in fact, the state is required to be non-discriminatory in giving aid. And therefore, it is not only possible, it is rightfully duty of the government to give such relief to the minority as may be given to the majority. Uh, there are questions people who would like to put questions as I am given to understand. I will therefore not take your valuable time and rest my... My case. My case. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Legal terms. <laughs> Old head, I heard. <laughs> yes, rest my case. Okay, Razi Bhai, back to you. Both short me ho gaya bhi. So thank you very much, Justice um, Akbal Saab. Uh, before we go to uh, question and answer session, um, coming next day, this is one special lecture. Usually we do only on Saturdays, but tomorrow at 10 a.m. USA time, 8.30 in India, uh, Professor Irfan Habib Saab, is going to talk on remembering Mahatma Gandhi 74 years after assassination. So please don't forget to join in and also invite others. Uh, and coming Saturday will be equally challenging um, topic, challenges to India's democracy by Professor Zoya Hassan from JNU and uh, Council of Social Development from Delhi. So thank you very much. And now over to our colleague, Dr. Rafat Hussain, who will be moderating question and answer session. Thank you very much, both the speakers and Dr. Rafat. Thank you. Thank you, Razi Bhai. And thank you to Professor uh, Fazan Mustafa and Raju Raj Gopal Saab, as well as the Justice of Balan Sari. So, I wish uh, we continue to hearing uh, Professor Mustafa's talk. It's always very analytical, thoughtful, and uh, thought provoking. So the session is open for question and answer. And please raise your digital hand or uh, say in the chat box that you do have a question. So before I go to the... Um, the people who are asking the question. Uh, let me begin one very quick question to Professor Mustafa. So you talked about the numerical inferiority and powerlessness. So I am just thinking of the example of the US where they say in a couple of years, uh, the whites will be in minority and, but they will still be powerful. And in terms of, uh, so how do you decide the, in terms of India's situation, how do you decide the powerlessness? Because India being a democratic country, anyone would say, okay, you have the power. You are in the government, you, are, you, are, you own business, you do all those kind of the things the majority is doing. <clears throat> so that's the one thing I, I just wanted to talk and then, Another question I can ask in the end, you talked about the regulation of states uh, for the minority institute. They have a latitude of regulation. So that's a very slippery slope where regulation, they can make a regulation such a way, although you talked about a lot of constrictions there, but I, I believe the regulation part by a state can be yeah, Rafat, I understood your question. 
uh, I would uh, uh, respond both the questions in one go. Uh, first, on the regulation, two test. It has to be reasonable. Two, it must make the minority institution an effective vehicle of education. Thus, any regulation which destroys minority character is illegal and unconstitutional. Now, about uh, powerlessness. Anybody who looks at the number of ministers you have, number of governors you have, number of IAS officers you have, number of professors and the vice chancellors will have. We know what is the representation of Muslims in all these sectors. Powerlessness, you know, we, as I said in the beginning, we are at all point low. If you look at all the MLAs taken together, if all the MPs are taken together, the Muslim number is at all point low. So in the power structure, if a minority or a group is not represented or his word view is not represented, that is said to be the powerlessness. For whites in United States, that possibility is, is still remote. It may happen in a few decades. I'm not denying that. But whosoever is powerless would need some kind of protection some kind of special provision. And that is what the minority jurisprudence is all about. Okay, so uh, the counter argument, I, I just want- Then uh, we will have a debate amongst ourselves. Let's go to- uh, Right, next right. Question. Counter argument uh, could be that it's a democratic society and then everyone is open and you don't. Anyway, so let no, me- No, I, I, I said it. In democracy, the majority will get laws passed, but majority cannot turn majoritarian. That's why you have judicial review. In a democracy, the minority groups will never get their people elected on their own yep. strength. Just because yep. they are voters, that does not mean that they are having power. Okay, the, I will come. Let, I will let, come. Let, let me put it in more bluntly. Even Azam Hasa has not been given some very high, uh, high uh, portfolio. He's made, you know, WAF minister. It is only in last regime he had some PWD or something like that. So you also need to look uh, that if you are in cabinet, what portfolio you are getting. Okay, I will come back to that question in the end. Uh, so the uh, next person is Hassan Kiyasa. Yes. Me? Yeah, please unmute yourself. Go ahead. Are, uh, I, my question and observation, so please feel free, anybody can answer that question. If we look at the Islamic history. Uh, and... I thought it was my turn to speak. Oh, okay. Who, who is uh, Hassan Qiyasa? That's me. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Fayaz, That's mine not is Fayaz Hussain, so I looked up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, clarify. Now, my question to Professor Fezan Mustafa. Uh, in your talk, uh, you asked uh, what kind of Hindu Rashtra uh, can it be or will it be? Now, don't you think that we can foresee the shape of Hindu Rashtra by understanding the nature of the forces that are driving the demand for this Hindu Rashtra and whether in, in a situation where in, a, in our current constitution, the rights and uh, of the minorities have not been in practice protected as they should have been what chances are there that such rights will be protected and preserved when we have, God forbid, done away with this constitution and replaced it by a Hindu Rashtra constitution? No, my Thank you. Take, uh, uh, sir, an excellent question. Thank you very much. Is unless they bring in public domain 
the proposed constitution, no meaningful debate is possible. It would be extremely difficult for any parliament to pass a law which will take away right to vote from the minorities or right to life or freedom of religion or freedom of speech and expression. This is impossible. And therefore, I personally believe while as the constitution stands today, there is absolutely no scope whatsoever of a state having any religion. The article which I had written was that the kind of rhetoric which we see these days, we are fast moving in the direction where these people will not be satisfied with anything less than Hindu Rashtra. And then I have said they will be most disappointed with Hindu Rashtra. And therefore I said it is better we debate what will be Hindu Rashtra because then some of their doubts will get cleared if they think that all the properties of minorities will become their properties or all the Muslims will be thrown out of India or their nationality or citizenship will be withdrawn, this is not going to happen. If they go in that direction, let us say that for the sake of argument that we reach a state where Hindu Rash is to be declared, definitely in the bargain, they will have to give a better protection to the minority to do that. And if they want to do that, the whole argument falls. Therefore, for me, I want a public debate. Okay, tell me what you want in this. X, Y, Z provisions, you tell me whether you will have a presidential form of government or parliamentary form of government. Who will appoint judges? What kind of election commission you will have? What kind of restrictions on fundamental rights you will have? Because you know, if you have a Hindu Raj, you may have to even give reservation in the parliament and assembly to the minorities. In Pakistan, you have a reservation. In some states of Pakistan, it is more than their proportion in population. And therefore, in my humble view, it is better to have an engagement on this subject rather than saying, no, 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 it is very bad. Because in that engagement, many people will be put off by this idea because it may not give them what they really want. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Abdul Jabbar, sir. Thank that, you. It's a great presentation. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for your... Uh, uh, <laughs> remarkable uh, clarity on, uh, sub on the subject matter. So I have a very similar uh, thought about your column in 2020, uh, Benevolent Hindrashtra. Uh, I think you tried to address that a little bit here. Uh, it created a, a touch of nerve uh, among some of our colleagues at uh, every university. Uh, so I posted the, uh, the exchange in the chat box. So. Well, can you kind of elaborate for, for us, at least, what, what do you mean by benevolent uh, Hindurashtra? No, I'm not saying it would be benevolent or that. I'm just looking at the reality of the modern world. So your, your column so, said, your column said benevolent. No, 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 no. I, I haven't used word benevolent at all. It, that word is not there. What I have said, it would be impossible to go either the Pakistan way or the Saudi Arabia way. Therefore, what are your options? Your option is England, where Queen is the uh, official head of the church, defender of the faith, or Greece, where the constitution and the preamble thanks the Trinity, or Sri Lanka, where the constitution says that Buddhism is the dominant cultural heritage. Beyond that, on a pragmatic note, nothing can be done. And if you want to do this, in the bargain, you have to assure your minorities that the Hindu Rashtra is not going to take away your rights. 
So what you have to do? You have to give them extra rights. The moment you want to give minorities extra rights, the appeasement tag will haunt you. And therefore, this whole debate will go. They cannot say, I take it from me, that Hindu Rash will have one category of citizen and second category of citizen and third category of citizen. Impossible. They cannot say that freedom of religion will not be there. Because if it will not be there, it will not be there for the majority also. Right to life and personal liberty will not be there. It will go for the majority also. So uh, only on Article 30 that minorities have right to establish and ad administer educational institution, I just told you that Hindus are also minority, both religious as well as linguistic. Even if they remove Article 30, assuming is still the minorities will have under Article 19 right to establish educational institutions. The only thing you may say that they may not have a right to have reservation for their community. But their right to establish educational institution and administer it cannot be taken away. Because that is there with all educational institutions. The whole private sector will collapse. Today, 67% Indian students go in a private higher education institution. So the whole argument I was trying to make uh, was this, that let us not run away from this uh, ghost of Hindu Rasht. Let us engage them, ask them, okay, tell us what are going to be the salient features. You want to change the basic structure. Okay, tell us. It will not be based on this. Will it be based on, uh, say, Manu Smriti? Which, which provision of Manu Smriti you want to incorporate in the constitution? On women, on punishment, on what? I think engagement will serve the purpose of secularists and liberals better. But many liberals and seculars and my own very dear friends were very, very upset with my article. And they said, well, we can see and read such kind of stuff from others, but not from you. But I did it intentionally because I say running away from the debate is not an answer. Let us okay, engage people you. and say, yeah. okay, we are not averse to this idea. You tell us. Maybe there is something very, very great in it. We will be wholeheartedly adopting it. <laughs> Who knows? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Man. Thank you. So there, there are many people lined up, so I want to you be very brief and come to the question directly. Please go ahead. Uh, Sayyad Amir Saab and after that, uh, Daya Saab. Um, Professor Mustafa, first of all, best wishes for the recovery of your mother. Um, Thank you. you are, um, I have two questions. First of all, you are a, a law constitutional expert uh, or scholar of the constitutional law. And this question doesn't necessarily apply to India alone. For example, in the United States, the Supreme Court, like every country, is the arbiter of the, uh, the law into our constitution. Now, we have decisions based on the inclination of the justices who sit on the Supreme Court without any change in the constitution. Now, for example, we had... Uh, I know, I understood, sir. Yeah. So, how do you protect against that kind of situation? Now, we have more conservative lawyers sitting on the Supreme Court, so their inclination is... Uh, towards the um, conservatism. The second question is, maybe you can enlighten us about the situation of the Muslim personal law in India. Um, is it in conflict with the constitution as is it interpreted today? And what can be done to bring it in conformity or is not the same? The situation is not the same. Thank you. Sir, unlike United States where you have Republican and Democrat judges, in India, we don't have that procedure. So uh, we cannot say much about the ideological inclinations of uh, Indian judges. But yes, uh, there are judgments uh, which uh, to a certain line. And the contempt law says that we will never attribute any motive to any judge. We will rather criticize the judgment on merit rather than say that the judge decided this way or that way because 
uh, yeah, he was uh, appointed by X government or Y government. And this is so because in India now judges are appointed by the judges themselves. Now about uh, the Muslim personal law, uh, there are two, three very crucial integrate issues. One is Muslim personal law uh, consistent uh, uh, with Islamic law. Because basically the Muslim personal law is the gift of British judges. That's why it was called uh, Mohammedan Anglo law, or Anglo Mohammedan law, something like that. Two, uh, there have been many reforms which have already been made, some by the ulema and then enacted in the law in the 1939 law, for instance, dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act, uh, uh, ulema came together, they showed uh, their liberal attitude, the inter-school borrowing was done, and a progressive dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act was passed. The problem, sir, is that uh, uh, we should not uh, overlook the fact that in every country of the world today, the constitution is supreme. Therefore, any religious law, it will be permitted to exist only when it is consistent with the supreme law of the land, which is the constitution. Now, the constitution at times itself gives that leeway to the religious minorities by giving them freedom of religion. Now, in India, the jurisprudence which has been developed is like this, that the courts say that if anything is an essential feature of your religion, we will protect it. But the non-essential practices will not be protected. And therefore, in the triple divorce judgment, was the Supreme Court was saying that triple divorce is not an essential feature of Islam. In fact, the judges were saying, what is bad in theology cannot be good in law. And if you say that giving three divorces in one go is a sin, why you are saying it is valid? I personally feel that there is a need for the ulema and the jurists and the experts of law to come together and first of all decide what is essential what is non-negotiable within Muslim personal law. And then they should engage the government that other than this, we are willing to have reforms. It is always good if the reform initiative comes from the community. But I don't want to further dwell on this topic, but uh, there has been a disappointment from Muslim clergy and disappointment from Muslim leadership because some of the very bright Muslim leaders, rather than taking the community to the path of reforms, just to get their votes or just to exploit their sentiments, uh, uh, put it as an interference in Islam. If you look at the whole Shahbano, uh, post-Shahbano uh, debate, uh, it was a very, very small amount of 189 rupees in maintenance. And the arguments like this, that the judges cannot interpret Quran will not work because they were basically not interpreting. They were quoting several translations from the Quran where word Mata in verse number 241 of Surah Baqarah has been indeed translated into maintenance. I concede the point that it is not a periodic maintenance and that translation is wrong and rather this word mata is some parting gift, some lump sum which is to be given at that point of time uh, when the a relationship is coming to an end. But uh, we should say that it's a wrong interpretation. We can't be saying that you will not interpret. So community must initiate uh, the process of reform and a reform can happen when you know what is absolutely non-negotiable. Which thank you cannot you. Have. Thank you, thank you, Professor. And then at least the inter-school borrowing should happen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh Next person is Daya Saab and then Fazal Khan. Daya Saab, please unmute yourself.
Go ahead, Daya Sahab. Uh, okay. uh, justice, can any caste claim that it has unique historical and cultural identity and therefore should be treated as a minority because their cultural heritage goes to thousands of years? Article 29 says any section of Indian citizens having a distinct culture, language, or script shall have the right to conserve the same. And therefore, any group, if it says that it has this culture, this language, this script, it is a right, absolute right to conserve it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Fazal Khan Sahib, and that uh, Sahu Sahib after that. Uh, Professor Mustafa Sahib, thank you for your talk, excellent talk as always. Nice to see you again. And we pray for the speedy recovery for your mother. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, regarding the Hindu Rashtra, in my opinion, I don't think that they want to make the Hindu Rashtra, rather they want to keep the myth alive uh, so that they can continue to exploit general public, in my opinion. Uh, the second comment is actually that, in my opinion, democracy by default empowers majority. As you said that, a minority cannot, although they have right to vote, and yet they cannot win the seat unless it, is, uh, it, it involves a majority. But my question is this though, that was comments. You uh, said that AMU could not muster the courage to challenge or debate in the Supreme Court about the minority character. Could you explain that what may have been the reason they were mm -hmm. afraid of losing or? No, uh, no, 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 it, it was not so. It was like this, that, uh, you know, there was a internal reservation. Ali Awar Jang Saab was the vice chancellor. So from 75% internal, the reservation was to be reduced to 50%. Because unfortunately, many of us think that the university is for the Muslims of Aliga, but that is not the law. The law is it is for the Muslims of India. So this uh, reduction in number of internal seats uh, became a bone of contention between the vice chancellor and the students. The vice chancellor was unfortunately attacked. Uh, his finger was broken and the university act was suspended and ordinance was brought in. And then a 1965 act was brought in. Now, in that act, they had said that the, all the members of the Executive Council will be nominated by the President of India. Similarly, the university court uh, size uh, was drastically reduced and about 98-99% members of the court would also be nominated by the uh, central government or the President of India. Now, some Aziz Basha, uh, apparently from Hyderabad, uh, went to the Supreme Court and challenged the 1965 Act, saying that this Act has taken over the administration of the university in violation of Article 30, which gives the right to Muslims to administer Aligarh Muslim So in the first place, the mistake was committed by Aziz Pasha because anybody who files a case uh, files a case against certain parties which are called respondents. So he should have made a legal Muslim university also a respondent. To the mistake was committed by the illegal Muslim university as well as soon as the news was out that there is a case uh, about university's minority character in the Supreme Court, a legal should have intervened. And I also believe the mistake was committed by the judges because if the university was not coming forward and all the records were with the university, 
the Supreme Court itself should have directed a legal Muslim university to be implemented as a party so that university's view on this whole issue could be heard. I believe that all of them committed mistakes, but more so by the university administration because it was a matter about university's character. And therefore, the university should have been before the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, many people for decades did not realize that uh, AMU was condemned and heard. Uh, this credit or this discovery, whatever you say, comes to my credit that I started making a lot of hue and cry. And when I went to the Supreme Court against the Allahabad decision, the first thing I said to in the Supreme Court was this that your judgment of 1968 is causing me problem because Allahabad High Court is not accepting the 81 amendment. They are still going to be governed by the 68 uh, judgment. Therefore, your judgment is to be reviewed because I was condemned unheard. And that's how it was stayed and uh, the appeal was admitted. And finally, now, uh, since we made a case that your judgment was factually and legally wrong, Supreme Court had agreed that a larger bench than the 1968 bench. 68 was a five judge bench. Now a seven judge bench of the Supreme Court will hear this matter. Thank you, where Professor. We are, we are, where Thank we you. are challenging the 68 judgment itself. So it Thank you. So challenge. there are more people lined up, at least four. So I intend to finish by one o'clock here, means okay. eight, seven, eight minutes. So next person is Sahu Saab, and after that, Fayyaz Hussain. Sahu Saab, please go ahead. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. Okay, uh, Professor Mustafa, thank you for uh, thank you very much for such a brilliant lecture. My question is, uh, you know, of late, the majoritarianism is being promoted in an aggressive manner by the state itself, particularly the ruling uh, regime at the center, and uh, there is a blood curdling call for genocide of Muslims. I think it's a brutal manifestation of majoritarianism. Now, in, and love jihad law, even instrumentally of law is used to promote this kind of uh, tendencies, which is obviously, you know, uh, obviously against the minorities. Uh, the, the whole target is the, the minority groups. So in such a situation when constitution is there, law is being used, you know, so then how do you protect the minorities? When they even even they are they, their livelihood being threatened, you know uh, the manner in which uh, some some of the meat shops have been closed and all that. So so you know constitution is there, everything is there, but all such things are happening. So then, how do you address this problem? Uh, my response is that violation of law proves the existence of law. The mere fact that we are saying that such kind of dharms and serfs and calls are unconstitutional, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear this matter. Uh, people who made provocative speeches uh, have been arrested. Uh, these are all good signs. So at times uh, you see violations of law, but if guilty are brought to book, uh, that is good enough. Uh, on love jihad, you know, there can be two opinions. Of course, my personal opinion is that uh, marriage is an absolutely private decision uh, with which a state has no business uh, to interfere or to approve or disapprove whomsoever people want to marry, they should marry. I also have written on this and spoken on this that basically it undermines the agency of a Hindu woman because they are trying to say that Hindu women are not mature enough to select their life partners, which I think is absolutely wrong. And uh, an effort to control Hindu women's bodies uh, is absolute uh, negation of uh, constitutional scheme. And I am pretty sure as and when uh, the high courts and Supreme Court hear these matters, uh, they are unlikely to uphold uh, this part of uh, this law. But as you know that this word love jihad has not been used in these laws. 
these laws are basically talking of forcible conversion. If somebody is converted under inducement or promise, of course, the definition of inducement and promise and allurement are absolutely problematic and very wide, uh, but uh, that is what it is. And again, there is a Supreme Court judgment uh, in uh, Reverend uh, uh, Stanislaus case where MP conversion law and Arunachal conversion law was challenged and the court has upheld that law. I believe that judgment is also wrong and HMCY has written that this judgment is productive of great public mischief and must be overruled. So just like Aziz Basha of 1968, this 74 judgment on conversion is the cause of problem of all love uh, jihad laws. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Next person is Fayyaz Hussain Saab. After that, Imtia Saab. Uh, thank you, yes, thank you very much. For, thank you very much for this opportunity. First of all, very quickly, I want to appreciate the organizers. It's a wonderful forum. It's a very learning experience for me, and I'm sure for many other. Professor Mustafa, thank you very much for your excellent lecture, and uh, I pray for your mother for a quick recovery. My question is very general. I was wondering if we compare Muslim minority in India with Jewish minority in the United States of America who went through so much, what is the difference between these two minorities that the difference in every aspect of their life is so huge? Maybe we left behind the science and all of those other aspects that are really important in modern life and we overemphasize on the spiritualism, namaz, rosa, and I'm not sure how much honest we are in that one also. It's a very controversial question, so please feel free, anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your Clergy yourself. is responsible. <laughs> okay. The so Jewish it's... clergy is not as conservative as ours. Right? Oh, really? Imtiasa. <laughs> Yes, yes, I was unmuting myself. Uh, no problem. Faisal Mustafa Saab and everybody. Uh, thank you for your very insightful talk and excellent question answers. I also wish quick recovery for your mother. My question is that we all know these days Muslims in India feel very harassed and insecure. Now, there are constitutional protections, provisions which we have discussed, political processes, they are all okay. And it is for the community to, I mean, get the benefit of those protections in the best possible way. But my concern, and in a way, what Fayyaz Hussain have mentioned just now, it may be a kind of follow up of that. I also believe. Muslims in India have a lot of responsibility for their upliftment. And there are two or three things which in my view are very deficient in the community. First, mutual respect they are <clears throat> at each other's throat easily. And second, lack of integrity. So, and I compare it with Sikh community. They have great community cohesion and service attitude. So if the Muslims in India will pay some attention to these aspects also, in addition to law, uh, constitutional provisions and political processes. What is the prospect uh, that the community can rise to this challenge or need of the hour and how it can be done? Thank you, Amtia, sir. Uh, uh, sir, thank you very much. I believe, sir, our laws are sufficient. In fact, uh, in terms of our law and in terms of commitment of the state, uh, uh, there is not much of an issue. But as you rightly said, that uh, minorities have to perform better than the majority. Uh, minorities have to ensure that uh, their contribution uh, to the nation building uh, will be a less than... Uh, and it will not be less than anybody else. And uh, I'm sure that uh, they have a bright future. 
uh, in terms of our own responsibility, as you rightly said, uh, we debate non-issues, uh, we get emotional and sentimental, uh, we still love uh, uh, fiery speeches, uh, provocative speeches. Uh, our clergy is, is still very, very conservative and living in some uh, different era. And our own commitment to the constitutional values, to the ideas of liberalism and equality, uh, I'm sorry, is very, very shaky. So if we don't believe in liberty and don't believe in equality and don't really believe in secularism, I think uh, expecting others to believe in it uh, will be a, a, a wrong expectation. Uh, we must educate ourselves and we must really commit ourselves to the constitutional values. Because if at all uh, any community in India uh, wants to have any future, that future will depend only on the realization of the ideals enshrined in the constitution. So constitution, as our prime minister repeatedly says, is the only holy book for him. It should be the only holy book for uh, most of us in terms of governance of the country. Mm -hmm. And it is the constitution which permits us to consider our religious books as sacred and to be governed by our religious books so far they are uh, consistent with the uh, constitutional scheme. So for any community to uh, uh, really have a say in the governance of the nation, of course, there will be things which the community have to set right. And of course, there will be things uh, which a state uh, has to come forward. For instance, the state has to invest heavily, in my opinion, in the minority education. Minority institutions must be protected because people who are going to become engineers and doctors they are not going to madrasas, they are going to secular education institutions. If we want uh, to deny this right to them, I think we are doing a huge disservice to the nation because every minority institution, as I said in my lecture, also educates non-minorities and it brings minorities from uh, madrasa to the mainstream liberal education where the chances of radicalizations are uh, very, very minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The last person is Rudranshu Singh, please. Good evening, Professor Fezan. Can you hear me? Am I audible, yeah. sir? Yeah, you yes. are audible. You are audible. I pray for the speedy recovery of your mom to the perfect of health, sir. And Thank I regular, regularly view you on Legal Awareness web series. So I'm your Thank informal you so student. My question to you, sir, was that, uh, as you said, that majoritarianism can be kept under check by judicial review. But what will happen if the judges are affected by majoritarianism itself? Because, for example, Kali Charan, who participated and who was most vitriolic in that Dharm Sansad, the nonsensical Dharm Sansad, if I may say so, has been bailed out from the Sessions Court itself. And the students of JNU, students of Jamia, they, they are bailed out from the Supreme Court and they find themselves in jail for years and years and months and months together. So what is the way out, sir? You see, as I said uh, before, that in India, uh, political parties don't appoint judges uh, like United States. So you don't have Republican and uh, uh, Democrat judges. Uh, uh, the threat, for instance, right now uh, in U.S. that Roe versus Wade uh, judgment may be overturned because uh, now you have uh, five conservative judges, Republican judges on the U.S. Supreme Court. Six. But, you know, at times, if you look at the challenges uh, to, uh, by Trump uh, to the uh, uh, election of last year, not a single judge, uh, and some of them were Republican judges, uh, even admitted that petition. So one has to concede uh, that once you are a judge, as uh, you know, uh, Prem Chan has written an excellent uh, story, Panch Parmeshwar, then you behave differently because you think that uh, uh, you have to do justice. Uh, 
uh, on bail you know uh, many people who even commit murders also get bail because bail under our criminal justice system uh, is considered to be a right in bailable crimes and it is the discretion of the court in non bailable crimes so uh, uh, there may be some bail orders which are problematic there may be some bail orders and uh, some denial of bail orders which may be problematic but in a country of our size and when different judges look at uh, problems differently uh, you know you may have a very tough judge you may have a very liberal judge there are judges who give bail to everyone there are judges who don't give bail to uh, anybody so uh, such things may happen i think we shouldn't lose hope i feel indian judiciary uh, is independent and uh, uh, we are uh, our judicial system uh, has been taking very good care of poor and downtrodden and even minorities uh, judgments about minority rights have been very very progressive so let us not lose heart uh, put our faith in the nation's constitution and uh, our legal system and uh, there may be some disappointments here and there at times you may feel like that we are going in a wrong way but uh, i think eventually uh, we as a, a nation uh, would not deviate too much uh, from the constitutional vision let's hope so sir Thank you, Professor Mustafa. That concludes the question and answer session. And thank you so much for all uh, speakers. We don't want to hold uh, Mustafa Saab for so long because he has two other things to take care. And we wish uh, a quick recovery uh, for his mother. And uh, so, Razibai is back. Gee, it was really a wonderful and very engaging session. We wish that we could engage further, but this is too much. I think almost more than two hours passed. And thank you both speakers and Mustafa Saab, especially to you because of the situation where you have to take care about your mother and you found time. So I couldn't prepare at all. <laughs> At, at my at my insistence, you know, you found the time to do this thing. So um, we should all pray for his mother for a quick recovery. And inshallah, she will be fine soon. And um, let's yeah, let's end here. Uh, because